Hey, I'm Osman Faruqi, and this is The Drop, a culture show from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, where we dive into the latest in the world of pop culture and entertainment. I'm here with Thomas Mitchell. The wonderful Mel Cambry is gallivanting around Europe for the next few weeks. How are you feeling, Thomas? You think we can hold this one down without Mel? Yeah, look, I think... I mean, this is kind of what we've always been aiming towards, really. <laughs> just just sitting in an echo chamber together, congratulating one another. <laughs> how great we are, how smart we are, how good it is just to have the fellas talking. Correct. Um, no, we're going we're gonna to do our best, but obviously we, we miss Mel. We've got a really, really big episode today. We're talking about Beyonce's new album, a really great new show on Netflix, and the brand spanking new movie from Dev Patel, which is out in cinemas this week on Thursday. Plus, we have an interview with Dev himself. So make sure to stick around for that. We'll play that at the end of the episode. But first up, some news that broke right after we finished recording last week's podcast episode. In fact, I think the SMH and the Age, our outlets were the ones who first broke the news. Splendor in the Grass is cancelled for 2024. And there is a big question mark over whether it will return at all. The reaction to this news was pretty massive. Obviously, it hits a lot of artists very hard, artists who rely on festivals like that to make an income and promote themselves. The news came at a time when the festival scene in Australia is in a bit of strife, generally grooving the moo, cancelled this year, Falls was cancelled last year, but it feels like the splendid news hit harder, like a lot of people who aren't in the industry I saw posting and discussing this. Why do you reckon that was, Thomas? Like, just Australians have a lot of memories of, of Splendor over the years? Yeah, it kind of reminds me of when like Big Day Out went and that felt like a moment. I guess, yeah, Splendor's always been one of the more like accessible festivals that even if you're not a festival head, you, you maybe have been to a few times. So the fact that Splendor isn't going ahead sends a pretty wide message to people who otherwise might not care if like Meredith isn't happening, that wouldn't like land on their radar. But Splendor being cancelled means like something is obviously broken. Um yeah, it's a really weird feeling. Like in my heyday, which I mean, look, you can argue when that may have been, but when in my <laughs> in my twenties, when I would go to Splendor, it wouldn't matter who was on the bill, it wouldn't matter who the headliners were, it was just about going and and you would have that rather than like, oh my god, are the tickets going to sell out? But like you know, yep. hoping that they would, you would be, you would be like at the computer waiting, as as we saw with like Taylor Swift recently. That was the same for Splendor back then. Like you would you would be like organizing with your friends to make sure everyone was trying to get tickets so you didn't miss out. And that's like going back, let's say 10 years. And now yeah. it's the complete opposite where like the festival is so broken that they can't sell enough tickets and, and, and now it's canceled. And it's just like that shift has been so rapid. Yeah. It's so interesting. That memory of Splendor I have is exactly the same. It was like Triple J would announce the lineup on you know the breakfast show and everyone would race to buy tickets. Splendor was the one where you really had to do it. Otherwise, you would miss out. Demand was just so high. I, I, I feel like earlier this year on the show, when we were talking about Taylor Swift, we talked a bit about this dichotomy that was emerging. This is a narrative that there's a cost of living crisis that is impacting younger people. And like, obviously that is true. Wages are not going up very fast. Rent is going up very fast. Cost of, you know, food and all those sorts of staples is going up very fast. So I'm not dismissing the existence of a cost of living issue in Australia, obviously, but there is evidence that lots of Australians, including young Australians, are willing to fork out lots and lots of money to see shows like Taylor Swift, to see shows like Fred again, SZA is coming to Australia. She's sold out three arenas in Sydney and Melbourne. So that is happening. At the same time, the festival sector is really, really struggling. And maybe those two things are related. Maybe people are saying, well, if I'm going to spend money, I'm going to spend it on this giant act and I don't want to go to the music festival. But I think that raises, I think, a real serious issue for the Australian music scene is how do you get some of that money back into the domestic sector as well. I feel like there's probably a lot going on with the collapse of Splendor this year. Is as you said, the idea of buying tickets urgently has just not been part of that festival's DNA since COVID. There was the 2022 rainy flooded Splendor that I was at, I was reporting from. I mean, people just had a really bad experience there. And I know that Splendor says we couldn't have predicted for the weather. I, I reported this at the time. The local council said we warned them of the risks of this. Uh, the, the fact that there weren't enough buses to get people home, that was an experience that happened last year at Splendor as well. So it seems like a lot of 
people just didn't have a good time at these festivals. And like you were saying, the festival experience wasn't just about the headliners. I know there's been this conversation around, oh, the lineup didn't hit this year. We would go to that festival not caring about who was on the lineup because we knew there'd be good acts. We'd discover some new acts. We'd have a fun time with our friends. But if you're having a bad time with your friends and the lineup's not great and you've got a bit of a cost of living issue and you've spent a bunch of money to see Fred again three times in Sydney, which some of our friends did, uh, not to name names, Gian, um, you know, you might not be as interested in that festival. Yeah, I, 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 I do... I do wonder how much of this is about the meta element of people not wanting to spend money on live music versus specific things happening at Splendor that made it not an appealing offer this year. But I also think there's something to be said, and I had this conversation with a uh, group of millennial friends of mine. I think there's something to be said about like the generational change and the cohort that makes up, I guess, like the lion's share of the festival-going audience. So like, I do think there are some key things that have happened that ha- will probably feed into the festival situation. So, like, firstly, mm. I feel like, you know, you see it with the Taylor thing. It's a good example and a recent example. I feel like Gen Z especially, like, their style of maybe music fandom is much more designed to be, like, obsessive over a single act rather than, like, be into a festival for its, like, vibe or the scene or anything like that. And, you know, the festivals don't typically, like, Taylor would never play a festival, but I feel like the style of that, like, the way that they fandom, like, has kind of made it harder to get them to go to things like that. I also do think, and this is, again, like, this may sound absolutely crazy, and this was just like an anecdotal chat with my dumb friends who, you know, I've (laughs) spoken about a lot on this podcast. What else do we have if not anecdotal chats with our moron friends? But, like, (laughs) okay, we all know that Gen Z are, like, doing less drugs and having less sex and taking less risk. They're a safer, more like, you know, digitally native generation who like, I, you know, I can happily sit here and admit when I would go to Splendor and stuff, much of the chat beforehand was like about getting, you know, drugs in, getting alcohol in. Like, how do we go about like circumnavigating the security? Like it, people were going for this like wild three day experience that was going to be like pretty loose. And I think we can all accept like, and the research shows that Gen Z aren't as into that kind of time. And I think that is a big part of why people go to festivals and that has changed. And that probably maybe is like, trickling into why festivals are now struggling a little bit. I don't know. I know. I think, I think all of that makes a lot of sense. I mean, Fred again, headlined laneway last year and that brought a lot of younger people to that festival fred again's like i don't need to be on the bill for a festival i can do my own show and make all that money myself and so you have festivals are like well okay all these big artists who would normally draw younger audiences to us aren't gonna work with us so that's an issue i think there's probably something to what you're saying as well about the lifestyle component these taylor swift and fred again shows the i don't know if wholesome is the exact right word for it but there is something very like flat about the experience there. And I had a great time at the Tales of Show. I didn't go to the Fred Again show, but they're not like raucous, let's get fucked up and party. And even Fred Again, who plays house and dance music, which has such a history of like drugs and, and dancing and the, the club experience and what that is all about, the environment that creates. None of the stuff I saw from that was reminiscent of those, you know, the, the kind of club days we had. It seemed very... I don't want to say like asexual is is maybe like too direct a term, but it wasn't like the sweaty party vibe, right? And and if that's what younger people want, more power to them. But that's not really what a festival like Splendor offers. So yeah, maybe the destination festival you camp and you're sweaty and you're not showered, but you don't mind because you're on pingers and you're drunk for three days. Maybe that's just on its way out. And what might be left are the the one day things in the city, like like laneway, for example. That could be where this goes yeah i mean and and I, it wouldn't really wouldn't surprise me like i don't doubt that splendor will take a couple of years off and then like probably come back and and see like if it can revive itself but i i also don't know if i hold out a bunch of hope that splendor will ever recapture its glory days like maybe something else will come in its place uh, that is more tailored to the audience that will most likely like travel to it and and kind of revive it but i think yeah sadly the glory days of splendor are in the past yeah, there's a government inquiry that's been announced off the back of the Splendor cancellation looking into live music and the health of the festival sector. I think that's a good idea. I hope a lot of people get involved in it. I hope that that 
leads to some broad conversations about the health of Australian music, not just an opportunity to pump millions of dollars of government funding into these giant companies. I mean, look, Splendour is a big deal in Australia. The The company that runs it is now majority owned by Live Nation, which is, you know, also in turn part owned by the Saudi Arabian investment fund. Like, I don't think those companies need government money. I think if the government is looking at policies and measures and funding, let's look at how do young people who want to make music, how do they do that? How do they afford to do that? Where do they gig if there are so few small venues left? How do they have a sustainable career path to cut a record and get played in Australia when Spotify and YouTube and the algorithms that are designed overseas to not necessarily spot local acts determine how the landscape looks? So I hope that review encompasses all of that stuff because I don't think this is just about one festival not having enough money to pull things off. So I think we'll we'll probably keep reporting on that over the next few weeks and months because it's pretty fundamental to the future of music in Australia. But one artist, Thomas, who I think would not struggle to sell tickets in Australia if she ever came back here is Beyonce. And last Friday, also just after we finished uh, recording our episode, she released her highly, highly anticipated album, Cowboy Carter. This is act two of what she's promised will be a three-part project. The first was Renaissance in 2022, which is a house and dance-themed album. Cowboy Carter, as the name suggests, is largely, but definitely not explicitly, a country album. She teased it during the Super Bowl with two tracks, Texas Hold'em and 16 Carriages. 16 carriages driving away while I watch them ride with my dreams away to the summer sunset on a holy night on a long black road all the tears I fight 16 carriages driving away while I watch them ride with my dreams away to the summer sunset on a holy night This album is big. It's sprawling. It's 27 tracks. There is a lot of country, but there's a lot of like, you know, just kind of generic adult contemporary rock vibes. There's some R&B and and hip hop as well. I'm really enjoying it, both for its country flair, but also I think the many different things she is trying on it and how I think generally they work. And look, not every single track is amazing, but with a 27 track album, that's to be expected. I also think having listened to it now for just under a week and listening to it many, many, many times a day, I think there are some pretty dense thematic themes that take a little while to settle. They they might not appear on the surface. And the early reviews, which have largely been positive, I don't think I've had the time yet to dig into what she's really trying to say on this album about where the music industry is right now, where America is right now. That's a lot to do on an album that is also just trying to be commercially successful. And I think it obviously will be. I went to a pub on Monday night, the Railway Hotel in Fitzroy North, and they were just blasting the whole album on on repeat, which is, I guess, an indication that the streets are into this. They're vibing it. What do you think, Thomas? How are you finding Cowboy Carter? Yeah, I like on first listen, I really liked it, and I kind of got what everyone was saying. I actually have a reverse experience, especially to what I normally have, in that the more I listen to it, the Less, I still really like it, but the less blown away I am. And ah, interesting. Excited to have a bit of a debate with you, perhaps, on this. Yeah, one. I just think it's really funny. You know, like there's so much chat about. I mean, there's so much chat on the album itself about the concept of genre, and we're in the midst of a country uh, kind of like uprising, and you know, people are trying to figure out is this country. And Beyonce, in the kind of announcement on Instagram, was like, "This is not a country album; it's a Beyonce album," and like that couldn't really sum it up better for me. Like it really is mm. just a Beyonce album and it's good. And some of the songs are amazing and some of them are kind of middling and, and I really enjoyed listening to it, but I guess I think I've been like listening to it and listening to it and like reading the kind of dialogue that's already kicked off. Like, and we're talking like the New Yorker, the Atlantic, the New York times, mm. like everyone's written think pieces. And I've just, I feel a little bit <laughs> Why do I do this to myself? I feel a little bit like I just don't know if I quite understand that this album specifically warrants that level of like discourse and debate. I think it's a good album, but I feel Mm. like maybe we've slipped into that era where like because it's a Beyonce album, we have to like project upon it all of this like 
intense meaning and and make it feel maybe more than what it is. And and the other thing I fear, um, as I did when I, you know, like maybe criticized Taylor Swift, I fear that when you say it to people, um, they're just like, because there's such Beyonce stands out there, you just instantly get like written off. Mm. Rounding off all of that by saying, I actually really like the album. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of where I'm at with it now. Maybe, and I'm, I'm talking like five days in listening to it two to three times a day. There's a lot of things there to unpack, I think. I think since since she released her self-titled record, Beyonce albums are impossible to separate out from the discourse that surrounds them. And I think that's gotten more and more intense for a bunch of reasons. I think, you know, Beyonce dropped out of nowhere and obviously people were just like, what is she doing? This is so different. This is so interesting. There's themes there about like feminism and being a woman and black sexuality and all these sorts of things that warrant interrogation. And then obviously Lemonade is just this big meaty thing about her life and her family and, you know, her the affair that Jay-Z had and all these sorts of things that, again, warrant enormous amounts of, you know, d- discourse and interrogation. Then there's the homecoming live stuff, which is the same thing. It's like this big statement as Beyonce as an artist sort of using these motifs and reclaiming them. And then we get Renaissance. So I, I, I understand what you're saying. That it can be a little bit exhausting that when a project like this lands, it can be hard even within the first few days to just live with it and not to be bombarded with takes about like, what does it mean? What are all the Easter eggs? What's Beyonce trying to say? This song's actually not good. This song is actually really good. And I think partly that's to do with Beyonce, but it's also partly to do with the way that media works, digital media works in particular, where there are so few artists left that everyone knows and cares about. So when Taylor Swift or Beyonce drop an album, everyone's like, let's go to town and write 20 stories because this will get the traffic hits. So I totally feel you on that front. And I've tried really hard to separate my thoughts from what I'm reading and seeing, because within 24, 48 hours, you've got people saying, this is amazing. And then people saying, well, everyone's only saying it's amazing because it's Beyonce. And actually, it's not really that good. And I'm like, none of these takes feel really solid to me, having been done in reaction to the album so quickly. But obviously, yeah, how do you talk about an album without talking about the conversation around it? So maybe like we we can come back to some of those questions. We can talk a bit about musically what works or doesn't work for us on the album. One of the things that I I think benefited from from sealing myself off from all the takes on social media and even in the mainstream sites was what I think is this sort of understanding of some of the the metaphors and the bigger ideas that she's trying to land, right? So we talked on our episode about country music, but the racialized history of the genre. And that kind of is a nice little pretext to the conversation I think we're going to have about this album. Beyonce said herself very directly that her experience writing a country song on Lemonade back in 2016, Daddy Lessons, left her feeling very unwelcome. Came into this world, daddy's little girl, daddy made a soldier out of me, and daddy made me dance, daddy held my hand, daddy liked his whiskey with his tea. She was criticised by a bunch of high-profile country artists for performing at the Country Music Awards along with the Chicks, and this album is at least in part a reaction to that experience. On the opening track, American Requiem, she says that pretty explicitly. Things how she was criticized for being too country, then not country enough. It sort of foreshadows that this album is going to engage with all of those ideas. She also, which I think is really smart, acknowledges the discourse around her. She says there's a lot of chatter happening. Like she knows that a Beyonce album is going to be picked apart and dissected. And then she pretty quickly dismisses what critics might say, which is also a very funny Beyonce thing to do is to say, I'm kind of making this album because of the reaction I got in the past, but also I don't really care about critics at all. Like you come at me, it's not going to impact me, which is obviously not really the case. I think the other thing that American Requiem, the opening track does, which I think is really smart, and 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 this has really only come to me in the last few days, is there's these two motifs that run throughout the album. This idea of the, the house, the pretty house that she says in American Requiem that they never settled. 
And we come back to the idea of the house at the very end of the album, uh, where it's kind of crumbling and the statues that are in it are not as beautiful as they seem. The other idea running throughout it, this metaphor of the father and the daughter, which I think is both a literal reflection on her relationship with her father, but I feel like both of these things also feel like they're a bit of a comment on America and the history of the music industry as well. Like these are both institutions, houses, that were built on the labor and exploitation of black people. Slavery is the clearest example of that, but within music, hard to think of a genre from jazz to rock to country, soul, disco, R&B, hip hop, that doesn't have black roots, yet black people have never felt like they belong in either of these institutions. The houses that that are pretty, but are built on their labor, but they don't really belong in, and maybe now they're starting to be exposed as vulnerable and 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 crumbling. And I think throughout the album, She's trying to remind us of the long influence black artists have had on country. Similar thing she did with Renaissance and the history of black influence on house and dance. For example, in this album, she gets Linda Martell, who's the black country singer who had the first ever charting country hit by a black woman to introduce a couple of tracks. Genres are a funny little concept, aren't they? Yes, they are. That Beyonce Virgo shit. In theory, they have a simple definition that's easy to understand. But in practice, well, some may feel confined. I swear for God is God is God. She's got young black women who are trying to establish their country careers singing on the Beatles cover. She does Blackbird. And she also takes on one of the most famous country songs of all time, Dolly Parton's Jolene and reworks it. Jolene, 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 Jolene I'm warning you, don't come for my man Jolene, 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 Jolene Don't take the chance because you think you can and there's a whole thing, I think, to say about that, because that seems to have been a bit of a lightning rod. But before we unpack the Jolene stuff, how do you feel about Beyonce directly, I guess, engaging with this idea of her doing country and what that means as a black woman of her stature? Yeah, like, I think it makes a lot of sense. And and like we said before, the, you know, there has been so much, like, when you, when you talk to people and ask, like, what they think about this album, pretty much the first comment lots of people make to me anyway, or have made to me is, oh, it's not really like a country album. And that that is kind of missing the point. Like, this was never going to be a 22 track hoedown. Yeah, yeah. And I and I, I really appreciate that. Like I, I went back and rewatched that performance at the CMAs, um, her and the chicks. And it's really, it's really interesting. Like you watch Beyonce's body language and stuff and, and you can feel that tension in the air and, you know, like there's an argument to be made. Like this woman is one of the most powerful people in music. She's a billionaire. Like, is it hard for her to feel unwelcome? Like you can tell though when you watch that clip. Like she was a bit rattled, and and so like it makes mm. a lot of sense that that this project has been a kind of fruition of that. Uh, and so I, I I think all of that is you know really interesting, and that's like the interesting part of the process. And and. And that for me is not the issue with the album, but like, yeah, I guess there are there are other things that I that I struggle with. But yeah, in terms of the way she's approached, like interrogating and exploring the black history of country music, um, I think that's like she's done an incredible job. I'm keen to know more about what didn't work for you because, like I said, there are a couple of tracks that I think like are skips for me. I, you know, a lot of people love the Miley and Post Malone ones. They're fine. They're not the ones that get me the most excited. But what doesn't land for you as well as you might have liked? Well, it's not even necessarily about like that I didn't like particular things of it. I just thought when I listened to it, I was like, this is just feels like another Beyonce album. And especially like the from like basically the the back half of the album, which is probably my favorite half of the album. Mm. But it's so like they're just like kind of R and B soul like tracks. And so yeah. when I was listening to it, I was like, these are good, but then like when I'm trying to match my response to it to the like response in the like cultural sphere i can't marry those two things up but it's funny because you say like just another beyonce record but like that bar is so high so even if it is just another beyonce record and it's just soul and a bit of hip-hop and a bit of r&b it's still like some of the best hip-hop and r&b around right yeah but it's like i mean it is good but like it's not moving the needle for me i'm also not Mm, like a massive mm. i don't like you know 
I'm a massive Beyonce fan from the get go. Mm. I really like her music, but I don't like. It's not like I'm an avid Beyonce listener. Yeah. So I, I, I just like I listen to it. and I'm like, this is really good, but I, I still can't marry up like the response to this particular album with like the music that I'm hearing. I think it's great and the songs like really land for me, but I still, I, I do think there is a, with each progressive Beyonce album and the more her like aura seems to grow, the like inevitable response that happens without any type of interrogation becomes like more and more rusted on. Like we're just going to, we have to like, you have to be like, wow, this is the most incredible record that's ever like been made. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely a factor that exists. And I think you see that, we mentioned this earlier, with people of the stature of Beyonce and Taylor Swift, where everyone's a bit scared to say this doesn't quite hit because what is the incentive for doing that? You get a lot of hate from fans and you look out of touch. The Washington Post, interestingly, had a pretty brutal like review of the album. I didn't really agree with it, but also I don't think that's bad. Like I think I think you're kind of right. It can be odd to just see universal praise particularly when you know, and even as someone who really does like the album, you still know that there's a part in the back of the minds of a lot of critics and editors and stuff that it's just like, this is going to be a big deal. We want to attract these people to our, to our website. Let's tell everyone how great it is. That That is a, a tricky thing when we're talking about something like this. Did you read that Washington Post review? Did that did that work for you? Yeah, no, it didn't work. For, it didn't work for me because I felt it was just like I almost felt that was like an outrage, like looking for clicks. Yeah. You know, like even yeah. the headline was like Beyonce's "Cowboy Carter" isn't a country album; it's worse. Like you can you can see what they're trying to do. Yeah, I think I've just found it generally like I actually thought the the most interesting take I read was the New Yorker, which came out this morning, uh, and that was by Doreen Saint Felix. She's a young American Haitian writer, yeah, awesome critic. Yeah, and her it was like the cultural comment section, and her headline was "Beyonce won't burn the barn down with Cowboy Carter." And and the review is like very even and very balanced, but not I wouldn't say positive. And basically, mm. she kind of says she says a lot of what I'm saying because we're both so smart. No, but like <laughs> she she basically says like Beyonce her weakness is her singularity. You know, mm. like she she does what she does, and even though the more she tries to show everyone that she's capable of all these different things, it only stands to like show how isolated she is from the rest of the music world. She's so famous beyond compare now that she just kind of is in this bubble in Beyonce land, like doing Beyonce things. I just I do think that the the criticisms have been like. I agree with what you said. It's hard when such a big moment occurs and then you listen to it a few times and then everyone rushes to get their hot takes in. Um, but, yeah, I do think the more I listen to it, the more I just am left with the feeling that it's a really good record from a really talented artist, but internally I feel like I'm supposed to be, like, fawning over it when really I felt similar to listening to the Waxahachie record last week. Like, I, I thought they're mm. both equally great mm. music. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and I think there's also a challenge when an artist has been at the top of their game for so long. How could they transcend? You know, I think we'll probably have a similar conversation about the Tortured Poets Department when that comes out. It's probably going to be a clinically well-executed record that hits all the right notes, but it's like after listening to 10 of these records from someone who can just deliver something that sounds really good, that's got good, interesting lyrics that can make people feel and want to dance or cry or whatever, it's like, this is what they do. This is what they're good at. I'm happy for them. I'm happy for people who like it. But is it is it doing something different? Maybe not so much, but maybe also that shouldn't be our expectation for someone who's been in the game that long. It's very, very hard for artists who have been making music for two decades or more to completely reinvent themselves in a way that feels authentic and is actually good. Often when artists try and do it, it seems a bit fake and it's bad. I mean, look at Camilla Cabello. She's not even as old or established as Beyonce and Taylor Swift, and she is reinventing herself as a hyper pop artist. It's it's really hard to like to like shake people up. And I think Beyonce's trying to do that a bit, but also in some ways playing it a bit safe by reminding everyone she can just do the R and B stuff really, really well. I feel like one track that has been a lightning rod for this album is Jolene, it's Dolly Parton's very, very, very famous song, been covered hundreds and hundreds of times recently by Miley Cyrus as well. Beyonce does something interesting with this one. She gets Dolly to introduce the track. Hey, Miss Honeybee, it's Dolly P. 
You know that hussy with the good hair you sing about? Reminded me of someone I knew back when. Except she has flaming locks of Auburn hair. Bless her heart. <laughs> and Dolly makes reference to Lemonade. Talks about Becky with the good hair. And then Beyonce changes up the lyrics and the vibe of Jolene pretty significantly. So instead of being a sort of pretty desperate, pleading song, begging Jolene to stay away, and maybe, you know, maybe expressing a bit of desire for Jolene herself, Beyonce is like, no, 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 get away from my man, you bitch. Like, I'm sorry, Jolene, you're a hussy, get out of here. I had to have to talk with you, because I hate to have to act a fool. Your peace depends on how you move. This didn't work for a lot of people. I don't actually know how you feel about this one. What, what did you make of Beyonce's rework of Jolene? Yeah, I didn't mind it. Like, I, I mean, I feel like I've got, um, I've learned my lesson with covers ever since I was like, Luke Combs' Fast Car is the best cover of all time. And every, <laughs> everyone made fun of me. No, like, it's really funny because, I mean, look, firstly, I was like, props to Beyonce for covering Jolene because, like, not only is she doing like a country um, album hmm. in theory, but then she's going to add like the most famous, probably the most covered country song by the, one of the most iconic country artists of all time. Yeah. So I thought yeah. that took like bravery in itself. Um, as a cover, I thought it was good. Like I, I, I respect the fact that she like shifted it up and stuff. I, I mean, it's really interesting, again, looking at how people have responded to this because it almost is like a um, snapshot of just generally people's issue with it or like what they love about it. I do think there is some merit in saying that, you know, the, the beautiful thing about Dolly Parton's Jolene is, is like there's so much like vulnerability in it. Like she, mm. the, the protagonist is like pleading and mm. it's a song that's coming from a really vulnerable spot, whereas Beyonce has refashioned it into something that's more of like a, you know, like foot stomping like call to arms, which has its own merit. But I think what I personally enjoy about the original Jolene is that position. Mm. Um, and so like, yeah, for me, it was just like, it was a good cover. I, don't, I didn't get angry about it like other people. Um, I don't know. What are your take on it? Yeah, a lot of a lot of people expressed that, that they thought that it, it sort of lost what Jolene was about, which I understand. But I mean, like Jolene, the original exists and various covers of it do exist. I think in some ways it would have been odd for Beyonce at this stage of her life and career in the year 2024 to sing something that felt so vulnerable and like pleased. Like that just doesn't vibe with where Beyonce is at right now. It's interesting also that Dolly kind of, I think, years ago really wanted Beyonce to cover Jolene. She was talking about how she loved when Whitney Houston uh, did I'll Always Love You and it's like, I'd love Beyonce to take it. Wouldn't that be killer? <laughs> I think she's fantastic and beautiful and I love her music. I would just love to hear Jolene done in just a big way, kind of like how Whitney did my I Will Always Love You, just someone right, that right, can right. take my little songs and make them like powerhouses. So that would- I don't know if she envisaged it, being done in this way. I didn't mind it. It sort of felt more honest and, and true to Beyonce. I, I enjoyed the Lemonade callback. But that said, and I think maybe this goes to your point about it being, you know, plumbing similar similar ground to, to earlier Beyonce work. The fact that the emotional resonance of this track and, and a few other tracks on the album go back to the affair, the alleged affair that Jay-Z had, which she talked about in depth eight years ago and talked about as much as you possibly could. I'm not saying she doesn't have the right to keep talking about it, but it does sort of suggest that maybe on that front, there's not much left for Beyonce to say. I kind of think the same. Well, firstly, like, you know, again, probably not a popular opinion, but I almost felt bad for Becky with the good hair. Like she's, <laughs> she's been put on blast like twice now by like one of the most famous women on the planet. And it yeah. takes two to tango. Like, you know, Jay-Z was involved in this. I don't know. It just feels, I, I think there is an almost a touch of like people feeling like, oh, okay, like the first time, fair enough. Now you're just like shooting fish in a barrel type thing. I mean, I am loath to bring Azealia Banks up, but this is probably the funniest fucking thing from this entire conversation. Yeah. Uh, Azealia Banks, famously level-headed, took to Instagram stories to tell Beyonce to find new content because nobody, and I mean nobody, capital letters, thinks Jay-Z is even remotely attractive. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I saw that and people, like, that's funny, but I mean, it's also not true. Like, it's obviously not true that there's never been anyone who's wanted to sleep with Jay-Z or, you know, like the affair was like seemingly true, right? 
Correct. Yeah. Like I think everyone knows that obviously something happened and, and that was like, you know, we got so much work from that. I, I do. I just, I just, I mean, I look, I'm always down for Azealia Banks. No, too. no. Well, she's been f- on fire with a lot of the reviews lately. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to say about the Jolene track is, you know, we have this tendency these days to take songs very literally. And that's not our fault. When I say us, I mean like music listeners, fans, critics or whatever. Like artists ask us to do that by relaying either in the music or on social media or in liner notes or whatever that this stuff relates to a thing that actually happened. But I don't think every time Beyonce talks about Becky with the good hair or the situation with her and Jay-Z or even when she talks about her relationship with her father, I don't think they're all supposed to be literal. I mean, even the original Jolene, Dolly says, that's kind of inspired by some woman who was, I think, working at a bank floating with her husband at the time. But- the name and the visual image of it came from a fan at a concert. So all of these things are like maybe a little bit grounded in reality, but artists are sometimes trying to make a bigger point as well. And I actually think there's potentially another layer to Beyonce's cover of Jolene that fits into the metaphor of the whole album. It's not just about the idea of Jay-Z having this affair with Becky with the good hair. The three songs, Dolly P, where Dolly Parton introduces Jolene, Jolene itself, and then the song that comes afterwards, Daughter, they all kind of smoothly blend into one another. When Jolene finishes, we get the segue into Daughter, and it's really interesting because the start of that track is Beyonce singing about how she's left a woman bloodied and bruised. Your body laid out on these filthy floors Your blood stains on my custom couture Bathroom attendant let me right in She was a big fan I really tried to stay cool But your arrogance disturbed my silence And immediately that makes us think like, okay, Beyonce's body Jolene here. This is, this is pretty hectic. And then later on in that track, she, she does a callback to, to Daddy Lessons. You know, she, if you cross me, I'm just like my father. And, and that original song, Daddy Lessons, was about what a woman inherits from her dad, particularly, you know, lots of references to to guns and, and the potential violence there if, if wrong has been done. And then it made me think, okay, so if this song is now referring us back to the overall metaphor of the album, could Jolene mean something different, not just be an actual physical woman? If this album is a reaction to the way that black people in some way have been erased from country and and the reaction that she got to daddy lessons jolene isn't just a woman it's not just a song it's it's a song that is very iconic and representative of a particular white country sound beyonce is literally killing her and saying like you know stay away from my man like you're you get out of here i'm taking him back I'm the one in charge of this narrative. I'm the one in control. You're dead. It's me and my man. It could be a metaphor for her relationship to country and the history of black country as well. She's saying, I'm literally killing you guys and I'm reminding everyone that like black people have been here from the start, so stay away from this genre. I'm not saying that necessarily she's literally intending it to be taken in such a violent way. But I think there is definitely a consistent theme and idea throughout the album of that. And I think there is a way to read Jolene, particularly when you add the coda of Daughter, that makes it fit in with that broader context of the album as well. Look, it's a good cover, bro. All right. I said I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think there could be something in that. Um, it's funny, though, because people have so such a like strange response to covers. Like, we really don't know how to take them anymore, and especially when you add in, like, the intense fame around an artist like Beyonce and then the, like, how deeply connected and attached people feel to a song like Jolene. It's really interesting to see the different response. And, you know, we joked about Luke Combs with Fast Car before, but, again, that's, yeah. like, you know, an iconic song from a much-loved singer-songwriter being taken on by this new voice in country mm. and people had a really strong like and polarizing reaction some people loved it some people hated the fact that Luke Combs didn't really do much with it like you know he he kept pretty faithful to the original Beyonce has obviously done the complete opposite I just feel like it's yeah if you're an artist and you you're going to include like a really famous cover on your album it's often like a lose-lose 
Yeah, but I think I think that as well, like there's the racial dynamic of that, the inversion there, I think is really interesting. It's like Luke Combs got some heat, but also he's a white guy, you know, who's built a profile for himself covering this song from a black woman and largely society, the industry, the Grammys, everyone was like, you're great. Like, good on you. Let's go. In fact, we're going to bring back Tracy Chapman, who we've pretended hasn't existed for like three decades to sing with you at the Grammys. Beyonce has done the opposite of that. She's taken a song that is so like part of the fabric of like white country culture and has, she's not an idiot, right? Like when people are saying, I don't like what Beyonce's done. Totally valid. Beyonce knew that she was taking a song that is so iconic and beloved and changing it, she's not a moron. She knows that some people might not like it. I think that is in and of itself a statement of what she's trying to do on this album is saying, I will take your totems and I will change them. I will literally maybe kill them in the next little bit of it. And it's, yeah, again, I think it's fine not to like what the song does as as just a song, as a changing of the lyrics, but I think as an attempt to literally, like very literally take that song and make it hers, it's interesting and, and, and sort of I respect that. Yeah, I do respect it too. Um, and I think it, it, it is funny to just like, I guess, sit on that and, and think about how people will continue to respond to it. But, yeah, I still think that uh, Luke Combs and Tracy Chapman at the Grammys. <laughs> the amount of times <laughs> you've been talking about Luke Combs on a, on a conversation about Beyonce is ridiculous. I just think it was a really great Grammys moment. And <laughs> I love Tracy Chapman. We used to play that record to death in my house. So uh, yeah. I, was, I was stoked for that to be back on stage. And, yeah, that's all you I have to say. You rewatching that clip of the Grammys just tearing up at your desk still brings me a lot of joy. Do you know the only live music clip I watch more than that one? Is, yeah. is Pete Murray and John Mayer performing at the Arias together. Um, We're was- not talking about Pete Murray and John Mayer on, on this, in Pete, this conversation. What's Pete Murray's famous song? Soon you'll see. <laughs> anyway, it's a fucking mad clip. Watch it. Someone's got this like a bootleg on YouTube. I will not be watching that. Before we wrap up the Beyonce chat, though, I wanted to ask you about any any highlights for you. I, uh, you know, I was had that big rant about Jolene. It's not, definitely not my favourite track on the album. I really enjoy um yaya and bodyguard which i guess are the most sort of mainstreamy poppy fun hits but the more i listen to the album the more i really love tyrant towards the end of the album it's introed by dolly again and then the beat hits and we hear dia got that dope uh you know the rapper tag for for the producer uh, it's really fun. Yeah, it's one of my faves. What about you? What did you like? Uh, so I basically had the biggest, like, let's fucking go moment with Spaghetti. Yeah. Spaghetti is my yeah, favorite nice. song by far. Uh, Great I, bars on Spaghetti. Oh, my God. So good. I ain't in no gang, but I got shooters and I bang bang. Like, <laughs> that's when I was like, okay, let's fucking do this. Yeah, uh, yeah. I also love Yaya. I really like River Dance. Yeah. Um, I don't hate the Post Malone track. It's weird. It's like, like, do you reckon Levi like paid for that song? Like, it's super weird. It's like we're all talking about Levi's again. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I like Post Malone. It's funny. Like, what did you make of the features on this album? Yeah, they're interesting because they really oscillated between Beyonce, um, like you know, hat tipping to black artists, and then it's like. Miley and Post Malone. And Post Malone is in his country era. He's like definitely not a rapper anymore. He's a country singer. Yeah. Um, which is really fun. Miley's obviously always had that country connection. I thought they were they were interesting choices. I know that people said, well, where was like Casey Musgraves on this? I think that would have been a bit boring and a bit obvious. Beyonce doesn't need to get desperate emergency country resonance by collabing with the biggest country artist right now. I think it's more fun to 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 talk to someone like Post Malone and Miley. I enjoyed those songs. They weren't my faves, but they were fun. Yeah. Yeah, agree. I thought that would have been really weird. And again, that would have fed into people's, like, I guess some people's suspicion that she, like, Beyonce was, like, jumping on the country bandwagon, which I don't think she is doing. But I guess this album arriving at this time of, like, you know, the country renaissance, some people think that. And if you had dumped on, like, KC Musgraves or whatever, it would have been a, a kind of a weird fit. Yeah. Well, Thomas, thank you for indulging my um, crazy thematic deep dives on this album and only mentioning Luke Combs half a dozen times. And John Mayer. I always got to sneak him in every podcast. Okay, so one of the biggest films this year, we talked about it, was Saltburn, Emerald Fennell's attempted satire on class starring Barry Keoghan and Jacob Elordi. Neither of us particularly enjoyed this film, but it was very, very popular. It felt very derivative, The Talented Mr. Ripley, which is one of our 
favorite movies and perhaps why we didn't vibe with Saltburn as much. We are very big Ripley heads. So how exciting for us that Netflix has blessed us with a new series based on the Patricia Highsmith book. It's called Ripley. False IDs, bank letters. What's going on, Tom? You crazy? I don't trust him. He's a liar. It's his profession. The corpse was found on the Via Piantica, struck on the head by some heavy instrument. My God. It stars Andrew Scott of Hot Priest from Fleabag fame and Dakota Fanning. It's written and directed by Steve Zalian, who directed The Night Of, the incredible HBO series starring Riz Ahmed. He's also known for writing The Irishman, Moneyball, American Gangster, lots of other collabs with Scorsese. Uh, For those unfamiliar with the Ripley story, the Netflix series, like the book and the film, is set in the 1950s. Tom Ripley, played by Scott, is sort of like a grifter con artist making a living by scamming people in New York City. He gets approached by a wealthy shipping industrialist who wants him to go to Italy, the Amalfi Coast to be precise, and convince his son, Dickie Greenleaf, to return home back to New York. It's an all-expenses-paid trip to Italy, so Tom is all in. Who wouldn't be? Uh, He travels to Italy. He befriends Dickie, played by Love Six Johnny Flynn in this series, and his girlfriend Marge, played by Fanning. Things get a bit complicated, though, when Tom tries to pry Dickie and Marge apart, and we get a pretty tense and thrilling adventure through Italy. Don't want to say much more, because there are significant spoilers in this series. I thought it was a pretty interesting adaptation. It's eight episodes, paced very differently, obviously, to the film, because it's much longer. In those episodes, I think you get to settle into some of the the themes of the book a bit more, like class and sexuality, Ripley's desperation to prove himself. I'm enjoying it so far. I'm only three episodes in, but what did you make of Ripley? Yeah, I finished it, um, so I've seen it all, and... It's interesting. Like, I really liked it. This is a running theme for me. I really like. <laughs> I really like the first few episodes, and then the deeper I got into it, the more I still enjoyed it. But I, I, I couldn't help but be haunted by the feeling of like, what exactly does this add to mm. like the Ripley universe? I guess only because the film is so great, and it's such a strong adaptation of the novel, and so many people love the film, and I guess. That's probably the point of this. Like, it's it's just for a new audience that would not go and watch a film from 1999 or don't have that as a point of reference in their brain. But at the end, I was a little bit like really enjoyed it. And Andrew Scott especially is is great as Ripley. He kind of toes the line so delicately between you know like a a full blown sociopath and someone who's very charming and and a chameleon. He's he's like very good as Ripley. But I I I did wonder if you're looking at the two pieces of work, what this adds to it, like, and not, not that it necessarily needed to change the story or anything like that. But for me, I still think the talented Mr. Ripley is, is always going to be the benchmark for, you know, Patricia Highsmith's novel. It's a really good question. And, you know, there's, there's been a lot of Ripley adaptations over the years. I think the first one actually was, is in the fifties, purple, purple noon. And then John Malkovich has played Ripley. Like this has been a very, I guess, well covered, well adapted book series throughout the decades. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of agree and disagree with you. I think, you know, like, yeah, what's the point of the adaptation? It's probably a little bit cynical. It's probably like, you know, let's let's look at what IP exists and how do we make something that maybe some people are familiar with and we can introduce new audiences to it. But I, I never actually read the books until the show came out. And I thought, okay, well, this is a good excuse for me to actually read the the Patricia Highsmith book and see what the differences are between the film and, and the series. And so far, it seems like this series is a much more faithful adaptation of the book than the film was. Obviously, I love the film. The changes that it made, fine with me. I like it a lot. But you get a little bit more, I think, of the ideas that Highsmith's using Ripley to explore. And I think Ripley's sexuality is a really interesting one. Like, she's never said he's explicitly gay or or queer or bisexual or anything like that. But... In the book, you know, he does muse on his attraction to men. That is part of the film as well. I mean, people talk about the bathtub scene in Saltburn. That is just like a shameless ripoff of a much more subtle and interesting bathtub scene in The Talented Mr. Ripley. But actually getting Andrew Scott, who is gay, I think maybe the first out gay artist to play Ripley, is really interesting in terms of the explicit way they talk about 
queerness and how maybe that fits into some of his motivations. Like there's experiences of homophobia that he has with Dickie Greenleaf. That is not something I've seen explored before in, in a Ripley adaptation. So maybe it needed to not be the 90s and you needed someone like Andrew Scott involved in the project to feel safe exploring that sort of stuff. I also enjoyed what I think are some of the sharpest critiques on rich people on this. Like one of my favorite bits is when Ripley gets to Italy and he's like, what are, what are Dickie and Marge, these just like rich kids bumming about doing? And they do what a lot of wealthy people do is just say that they're artists. And it is very clear that they are not very good artists. Dickie is a painter. Uh, Marge is like a poet photographer. And he's clearly disgusted with them. And I thought that's like an interesting critique of that class of people. And Tom is clearly so disgusted by it because that's not what he comes from. He's like, God, you guys are the ones who have the time and the resources to make stuff. And you suck so bad at it. The The more basic take as to why I, I'm enjoying the adaptation why I'm sort of happy it exists is it looks phenomenal. Like it's shot in black and white, shot on location in Italy by uh, the DOP Robert Elswit, who won the Oscar for filming There Will Be Blood. I know that some people think it's a bit indulgent and like there's all these like long lingering close-ups on cigarette packets and just like old Italian men, but that's TV, man. Like I'm enjoying that as well. Yeah, no, I agree. It looks amazing. I'm I'm so here for the black and white. And I do think like, you know, probably my my favorite thing too is the interrogation of like Dickie and Marge and and that class of people who just like they live the life that everyone talks about in their daydreams, like to move to mm. Italy and mm. and have no purpose and pretend that you're, you know, working on a masterpiece or writing the next bestseller and it's so funny as well cuz again, this is not, no real spoilers, but you know, Marge like offers some of her writing up to Tom to look at and you can just tell she's so amateurish and and yet mm. in her mind she's this tortured artist tucked away in the, you know, Italian seaside working on this amazing novel. And that, and that is a luxury of indulgence that is only afforded to people of a certain class. And so that I appreciate. But, yeah, I think, I, again, I still felt at the end, I was like, okay, really good show, but um, whether or not I, I felt like it massively took the Ripley legend and 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 leapt it forward that much i'm not sure uh but yeah I, I still think it's it's a great show and you know we've talked a lot recently about what netflix is doing with itself mm. and this is definitely a step in the right direction in terms of like something more experimental and something that offers something different for viewers but you know i was reading this thing recently about there is just and this could just be you know me looking back with rose-colored glasses but there was something magical that was like a bit lightning in the bottle of the talented Mr. Ripley, like it brought mm. together this cast that was all on the verge collectively of like yep. making it into the yep. next stratosphere of being a star. It had like, you know, Jude Law, Matt Damon, Kate Blanchett and Gwyneth Paltrow, you know, they, they brought together this really unusual script. The director had just won like a thousand Oscars for the English patient. Like it was this magic time, I think. And I think the film captured something that has hard to recreate. Uh, and so for me, the talent of Mr. Ripley, uh, kind of remains up there as the benchmark. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not sure this will be that popular as a series. Maybe I don't want it to be popular cause I don't want, you know, South of Italy to be slammed with people more than it already is. Um, but it's just like, it is a bit different to most Netflix series. It's a bit slower. It demands a little bit more. And I just wonder whether people will like get bored with it because it doesn't have that sort of frenetic pace that a lot of Netflix shows like One Day or, uh, you know, Three Body Problem have. So I'm interested. Do you, do you think this will hit for for people? Yeah, I think maybe like it'll be a moderate success. Like there's enough, you know, we are in a bit of a trend of like, I guess like eat the rich movies and TV shows. Yeah, they market yeah. it as like, you know, if they almost tap into the Saltburn hype and market it like that. Also, I think Andrew Scott has had like a bit of a moment recently. People love him. So like that could work. But yeah, I, I, I can't imagine it's going to be like sitting at number one and people will, you know, it's not going to be the country carter of Netflix TV shows. Yeah, and Netflix hasn't been like pushing it that hard, even though it's out this week. There hasn't been heaps of buzz about it. So hopefully you've listened to it from this conversation. And uh are going to give it a spin. Dev Patel, Thomas. Yes. We've loved him since Skins when he was playing little Anwar. We loved him in Slumdog Millionaire. We loved him when he was playing an Australian in Lion. Still the best guy to do an Australian accent who's not Australian. Uh, we loved him even more when he moved to Adelaide and kind of became one of us. And recently he's been great in a couple of films, The Personal History of David Copperfield and The Green Knight in particular. Now he's back on the big screen 
with his debut as both writer and director in a film called Monkey Man. He stars in it as well. When I was a boy, my mother used to tell me a story of a demon king and his army. They brought fire and terror to the land. Until they faced the protector of the people, the white monkey. There you are. You are a beast. The film is a big, bold, and very bonkers, I think it's fair to say, move. It's an action movie. Uh, when the trailer dropped, it evoked a lot of John Wick comparisons, but it's also clearly a homage to kung fu movies, Bruce Lee, Jet Li films, films like The Raid, both of which are in turn very strong influences on the Wick franchise and, of course, Bollywood as well. The story is also pretty wild. Patel plays a, a character just called Kid, who as a child witnesses the death of his mother and the destruction of his village at the hands of corrupt cops billionaire industrialists and religious extremists. So, yeah, a lot going on. Um, As an adult, he spends his time wrestling, wearing a monkey face mask, and working his way up the ranks of the Indian underworld, hoping to exact revenge on the people who destroyed his childhood. It's pretty clear in his politics, the film, and feels like a pretty sharp, direct, and urgent intervention into what is going on in contemporary India right now with religious sectarianism, The bad guys are an alliance between Hindu nationalists and corrupt police. There is real footage of very violent events that have taken place in India recently mixed into the film. There is a character who I think is a clear stand-in for the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. It's a really big move, a big swing from a first-time director, even one with the experience in acting as Dev has. Thomas, what did you make of Monkey Man? Yeah, I, I liked it. I mean, there was a lot going on. It, 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 <laughs> it felt like, um, you know, Dev, as a first-time director, had like a bunch of ideas and mm. most most of them really good, but no one was like, hey, man, why don't we just do like 50% <laughs> of those and then keep, keep the rest for like Monkey Man 2 or your next yeah. movie or whatever. Yeah, he's seen a lot of movies and he's like, I want to do what they did in that movie, in this movie, a bunch of times. Yeah, and so like I think that then trickles down and has like a strange effect on the tone of the film because mm. like you mentioned John Wick at, at times this felt like a John Wick like you know high concept action film then it became something else then it became something else and when you change like the speed and tone so much you do then lose a bit of the like like pacing of the film and yeah I guess that was it it was more just like oh, for someone that's obviously so talented you can see all the potential but yeah it was maybe just he needed someone to say no to him a few more times. Yeah, I think maybe it also lands differently with the knowledge you have about what the film is trying to interrogate. There was this review, I think it was in The Guardian, uh, after it premiered at South by Southwest, that I actually found a bit frustrating. It was the reviewer saying, you know, like, I'm telling you the plot, but also I didn't really understand any of that, but I borrowed it all from the notes that the studio gave me, something to do with, like, Hindu nationalism, blah, blah, blah. And maybe it's not the reviewer's fault. Maybe it's more a reflection on, on those of us in the West and the lack of coverage mainstream coverage or or just political focus here on what has been happening in India for the last few years. India is a very, very, very big country uh, with with a very, very big history. And there's a giant Indian diaspora in in countries like Australia, the UK, the US that are being impacted by the the very, very sad religious sectarianism that is going on and the, the extremism being espoused by the Modi government. So I guess it's not anyone's fault for not knowing about it. I think the more you understand what he's grappling with, the more the movie hits. It's something that affects me and my family and a lot of people we know. And I guess I sat at the center of the Venn diagram for this movie as someone who loves John Wick, but is like, what if instead of just like random Russian gangsters, the focus was right-wing Hindu extremists? I'm like, sign me up, man. <laughs> so you've taken that idea out of my head. Do you think that's a part of it as well? Yeah, for sure. I think there is like a level of disconnect there. But that, I mean, for me, I I was on board with all that. Um, yeah, right. I think it was more just yeah. It was it was it was just a bit like hard to get into the rhythm of the film when it changed so much. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I think there is definitely like an element of that. People will just go and 
you know, they'll watch the trailer, they'll think this is an action movie, and then suddenly when you're being sold this kind of like puppet figure and then they just like won't engage <laughs> with that, like they won't understand what's going on. And, and that, you know, is kind of an indictment on on audiences generally we need now to be just like hand-fed stuff. And if it requires any level of like prior research or prior knowledge, mm. then like unfortunately there's going to be like a drop-off. But, yeah, I think like I, my biggest takeaway from the film, I think, was like walking away and being like, fuck, I, I feel like Dev Patel is like, on a path now like you you yeah, can see yeah. that this guy he's like such a talented actor and and even to act and direct in a film like that where he's in basically every single scene hmm. um and we've seen that he has like serious acting chops but yeah i mean like i think it's definitely the first step of dev patel being like possibly one of the most important like creators out there in the next like 10 15 years i really agree with that i really agree with that like i think you know you said maybe let's pull back 50 percent for me it'd be more like maybe 15 20 percent. i just think there was a little bit too much okay i've done this kind of thing now what if i showed you someone in a car crash as a first person perspective and what if i did a little kind of like art film thing and it's just a little bit too much but obviously he's got great knowledge of film he's got great love for the history of cinema he knows how to like not just pay homage to that, but bring it together in a way that when it works, it works brilliantly. And if this is his first film and he's choosing to take on something as big as this, and he's done what is largely a pretty fun, pretty high octane, thrilling sort of a film, if he gets to do it again, and I really hope he does, I can just see him getting better and better from here. The the actual journey of this film coming to screens has been pretty complicated. So I'm glad it is. It was originally acquired by Netflix in 2021 when I think it, it finished filming and they didn't release it. There are unconfirmed reports that that's because they were worried about it being perceived as anti-Modi and generating a backlash in India. Thankfully, Jordan Peele of Get Out and Nope fame saw it and decided to acquire it, which is why it's being distributed by Universal. It's, it's in theaters now. There's been some changes. We don't really know what the Netflix version looked like and how much it's been changed since then. We do know that there's a new score. Um, Jed Kozel, who's an Australian musician of the Mess Hall fame, uh, he has done the new score, which I think is, is pretty great. Um, I'm glad that it's been sort of salvaged. I'm glad it's getting a theatrical release. There's a bit of marketing behind it, and I think it could do well, just if people want to see the action stuff, even if they don't think it all held together. I hope it does well enough that Dev gets another go. Yeah, me too. And like, it is so good that it's getting like a theatrical release. And I do, I, th- I, I, I suspect that like the John Wickness of it will get a lot of people in. And even just like talking to people now and asking about like their awareness of the film, people have been mm. like, oh yeah, like Dev Patel's doing an action movie. So like, yeah. even just if they get like sucked in off that, I mean, and that being said, like the action sequences in this are pretty fucking amazing like the choreography is great and they're also like you know some of them are very very graphic it's got that john wickness to it where it's like the almost like the level of creativity of how people can hurt one another is so impressive uh that you get very much sucked into it so (laughs) some of the ways some of the injuries in this film man uh a lot i know and we watched it in the screening together and there was like collective audience like oh and then laughter and stuff it was really fun one to watch with a group of people actually yeah it was a really good crowd engagement because like yeah some some of the injuries are particularly gruesome so just know that going in but um definitely worth (laughs) seeing on the big screen so in my conversation with dev he was really eager to point out that the politics of this film which i thought was interesting i asked him uh, about it directly he also made the point that it is not just about india like obviously it's set in india and i'm using that to talk about it but I'm talking about extremism across the UK, across the US, all over the world, which I think is interesting. He wants the movie to not just be seen as a story of India, but to resonate with Western audiences who watch it as well. And yeah, I think I said this already, but if more first-time directors were willing to grapple with big ideas like that in in a genre format, we'd be better off as consumers, as fans of, of film. If Beyonce has taught us anything about genre, it's that it remains <laughs> undefined and we should be playing with it all the time. So. <laughs> that's that's it. That's the Beyonce's Country Carter and Dev Patel's Monkey Man in conversation with one another. That's it for us. Stick around to listen to my chat with Dev about making Monkey Man, his, his influences and why he wanted to tell the story. That's coming up. But Thomas, thank you so much. Pleasure as always. Welcome to the show. Congrats on Monkey Man and the incredible response it's received so far. Wow, man. Thank you. Thank you. Can you talk to me a little bit about the genesis of this project? I'm keen to know how long you've been wanting to write and direct and why you decided to tell this story as your first one. Um, It's been over 10 years, man. And I, you know, just as a consumer, 
of action cinema as a as a as a humble fan of the genre. I I wanted I wanted more. I wanted more representation. I wanted I wanted deeper stories. Sometimes, you know, I I, I you know I think it can hold more. And and my grandfather used to tell me these stories from the the Indian mythologies of this character called Hanuman that totally just filled my mind with all this amazing imagery. And um, the more I traveled and worked in India, I realized I could like take some of these deeper issues of, you know, the caste system, you know, violence against women, religion, politics, all of that, and, and, and kind of fuse it into the action genre to create something, you know, hopefully quite unique. Um, so it's, that was kind of the inception. You know, I've, I've, I've just loved this action films for a really long time. I think your passion for those films is pretty, is pretty clear from like a lot of the homages and, and references in the movie. I know from the second the trailer dropped, everyone started talking about John Wick. I feel like the movie, Monkey Man itself, acknowledges that without spoiling it like pretty straight up. But I also know that you're a big fan of Bruce Lee, Bollywood. A lot of Monkey Man reminded me of movies like The Raid, the 2011 Indonesian action film. Can you talk to me a bit about the cinema that you love and and how Monkey Man fits in to that sort of I mean, lineage? I got, got into acting watching Bruce Lee, you know, way past my bedtime, seeing a an Asian man with so much charisma, that got me into cinema. And then it was like, you know, Bruce, J Jackie, Donnie Yen, Jet Li, Samo, you know, then the Raid films, um, and obviously Arnold Schwarzenegger and all, all those kind of American action stars. And then once I got introduced to Korean cinema, you know, everything from Old Boy to A Bit of Sweet Life mm -hmm. to I Saw the Devil, Man From Nowhere, List goes on. Those guys, for me, do it better than anyone. You know, it's it's ultra violent. It's sexy, and and they're not afraid to kind of double, triple down on the pathos and the emotion and mm. the kind of social kind of commentary through their movies. Those were huge influences for me. You know, um, and and you know, Bollywood cinema. You know, my grandparents. Every time I'd go over, there would be a Bollywood film playing or. You know, this actor Shah Rukh Khan, who I love, he did this film. Yeah, can relate, can relate to that, my friend. Yeah, yeah, he did a film called Koila, and I don't, I don't remember the plot too well, but I remember as a kid watching it, and he had these bloodshot eyes, and he was holding this bloody sword, and he was covered in sweat, and I was just like, yeah, just, it's a cocktail of all those things. As well as all of those kinds of films, you've, as an actor, worked with a pretty incredible roll call of filmmakers. Danny Boyle, Michael Winterbottom, David Lowry, Wes Anderson most recently. Did their approaches to filmmaking influence you at all when you were making your first picture? Totally. Um, you know, having, having never been to an acting school or a, or, a, or a filmmaking class in my life, my whole career has been, you know, not sitting in a trailer, being on set and just being so excited to watch these filmmakers, you know, be total dons on set and like you know the, everyone has such a unique approach you know whether the, the ferocity of Danny Ball and how he how he directs his films and the ingenuity with how he moves the camera and where he puts it to someone like David Lowry who you know uh, has such a beautiful soulful approach to the way he makes his movies and a spiritual kind of like dealing with time and 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 Wes compositionally you know all of those guys kind of I think subliminally have kind of infected my taste and, and process. It's really interesting to hear you talk about that because I feel like there are so many so many different swings you're taking with, with Monkey Man. There are these frenetic kind of first person perspectives in the middle of action and then you sort of zoom out and almost sort of like video, video art moments as well. It, it kind of seems like you're trying to either just express a lot of what you've enjoyed about cinema in the past or just try and do so much in one film? Yeah, it's it's a bit of that. Having done martial arts my whole life, I, I feel like, and being an actor, I just wanted to get the audience as close to being inside of the action as they could. You know, sometimes action is heav heavily reliant on being super wide and watching from afar, you know, great, but you know, I wanted to be internal. I wanted to be under the armpit of some of these collisions and and feel what it's like. You know, we had this swing shift camera, which is a lens put on a camera with bungee cord that actually can wobble. So when you punch the the rig that we created, it would wobble and shake and feel like concussion. Um, and sometimes, wow. like that staircase scene, I went and reshot that with my own little Canon camera. We didn't have a staircase 
what I'd scripted, we couldn't shoot. We, we, you know, we were in a pandemic and we couldn't get a location. And so I, I, I couldn't physically get the camera wide enough to, to cover the shot. So I ended up just strapping it to myself and, and I was like, okay, how can we, through obstacles, find opportunities? And so it's, it's a scrappy way of telling a story, but it's, you know, a mm. by any means necessary approach. I love those details. I feel like I could talk to you about cameras for a lot longer, but there are other things people probably want to hear about. I mean, other than other than the extremely well choreographed action and the genuinely thrilling kind of nature of the movie, what I appreciated, I think probably most about the film was how the story addresses head on the politics of, I guess, modern India, but so much of the world as well in a very layered and kind of complex way. You're directly addressing the rise of Hindu nationalism and the sectarian conflicts that, that are existing there. But at the same time, you're not letting anyone off the hook. There are corrupt politicians. There are politicians who are stooges of billionaire industrialists. There's corrupt police. Is that dynamic the one that you see operating in India right now, the story that you're sort of telling on uh, screen? Like you quite quite rightly said, it's it's a universal issue. It just happens to be set in India. But, you know, I think we're all the underdogs of our own story. You know, everyone can relate to that journey of like, of that. And And for me, I wanted to tell a revenge story about faith you know how it can be manipulated weaponized you know corrupted and 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 how you can mobilize a large mass of people and kind of touch on raw nerves with that subject mm. matter at the same time i wanted to you know show the beauty of that culture you know how you know an uneducated child in a in a forest can look at an iconography of hanuman standing for good and and and, and be inspired by that and don a rubber mask and 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 you know you're seeing these things play out. I mean, police brutality, you know, um, you know, religion seeping its way into politics, you know, fear mongering amongst politics, you know, all of those things, you know, violence against women, you know, that's not just happening in India, that's happening everywhere in the world, unfortunately. And sadly, it's more topical than ever right now. There was an early review of, of the film, I think out of South by that said that, look, the film, is pretty complicated if you're an average Hollywood goer and the reviewer said they needed the studio notes to make sense of the political themes. <laughs> Personally, I mean, that felt a little bit lazy to me. We can grapple with so many weird and absurd, like I watched The Green Knight and I don't need to be an expert on the history of King Arthur and stuff. But do you think that that sort of speaks to perhaps a lack of how frequently Hollywood in particular delves into stories that are outside of yeah. what america basically yeah yeah i mean um yeah this is not a tiktok video man you know like i feel like we're, <laughs> we're, we're trying with cinema is for me about um it's sensory and it's emotive and um you know coming at it from an actor's perspective like for me it's like you know for me I, I also just for, personally i can listen to the same artist and the same song a hundred times over and not remember the lyrics but i i know how it makes me feel you know, mm. and, and that's what I want my movies to represent if I'm gonna direct, you know, a film again. I want it to evoke a very primal sensation, you know, this movie. And um, at the same time, I don't want it to just sit down and be a, a three hour lesson in politics, you know. Uh, so there are more meditative moments in the movie and, and they're there to test your patience and make you wait on bated breath for the moments of explosive violence. And I have a cut of the movie where it's tighter and it's just more violent and it kind of just, it washes over you. It just becomes a, a kind of barrage of punches and kicks with no real kind of emotional tethering to it. So for me, it's like, it's that that odd cadence that I wanted to create with it and, and, um, and, and delve into these kind of more spiritual realms of subplots and human psychology and Indian philosophy. And I think um, that that's basically, you know, my intention with the film is to, you know, I want it to fit in the genre. I want it to tip its hat to the, I want to, you know, we have a training sequence in there that I hope stands the test of time with some of the great ones. But it mm. also has an amazing social commentary within it, but it's also just mm. a badass musical piece or a performance piece of action. Either way you peel it, I think it holds up, you know? So, yeah. Is it was challenging, but you're, not, you're never going to win them all, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, I know that you said that so much of the film's themes and, and message is widely resonant across the world, and I 
makes total sense to me. But you also talked about wanting to evoke a particular response. And because the film is you know, addressing pretty bluntly in sections what's happening in, in contemporary India right now, I wonder whether you have a intended or, or you know, do you, do you think about young Indians perhaps in, in the motherland or in the diaspora watching this movie and thinking a little bit harder about what is actually going on in India at the moment? I mean, some of my best friends, you know, the people that I would consider my brothers, you know, that live in Mumbai and, and, and all over India. I have family members there and I, I completely, you know, the kind of when you particularly, you know, I, I, we just produced a documentary called To Kill a Tiger, which got nominated for an Oscar. And it was about a, a gang rape of a young teenage girl in a village and mm. kind of the kind of mm. the the kind of mentality, the village mentality surrounding that incident, you know, and most of the villagers thought the right thing to do was to make the girl marry one of her attackers because that would bring, mm. you know, more honor to the situation. This stuff is prevalent there. If you look all the way back, you know, and you go and read the papers, this is so much corruption and, and, and the, the disparity is very prevalent. And also, you know, that was something I did want to touch on within the mm. story. You know, there was a rage I felt when I was in India after what happened in Delhi, you know, to Nirbhaya. Mm. You know, my partner was an Indian girl at the time, born and raised in Mumbai. And the blistering rage that every man, woman and child, the youth felt, that was what was kind of the catalyst for me of, of you know, people like Dev. I, did, I didn't know you were so angry, but um, unfortunately I knew a girl that I'd met, an Indian girl that actually got raped and, and killed. Um, her name was Monica, uh, and it made the papers out there. So th there's not even a six degrees of separation with some of this stuff, you know? Um, it's all mm. too close to home sometimes. Mm. You mentioned the, the Oscars. I'm sure you've seen the debate, the reaction to the speech Jonathan Glazer, the director of The Zone of Interest, gave. I mean, this movie is is very political about something that's happening in India now, but I think, like you said, it resonates about what's happened in the past, what happens in the future, which is sort of what Glazer was alluding to about his work. Are you worried at all about any kind of backlash to the themes, the ideas, the kinds of people you're addressing in, in Monkey Man? I mean, I, I made the film... Uh, with the best intentions, you know, and uh, I, I made it as a celebration of the underdog. And I, I feel like it really celebrates so much of the culture in the country. Um, but again, like I didn't want to make a sort of tourism video or something, you know, uh, and I, I wanted to make a film that had a real soul and was grounded in real plight and, and, and trauma and pain and have a sort of social resonance, you know? And, I, and, and the reason I, I made an action film and not a, a, a drama film that maybe if I was lucky, a hundred film would, uh, people would see was for that very reason. Mm. I wanted to access an audience, mm. the audience that played those video games that I don't, that watched those John Wick movies, the middle of America. Um, and I feel, like I said, th this is, um, it happens to be set in India the same way Parasite is set in Korea. But it, it, those themes and why that film did so well and is, is because the themes are universal. You know, this is, this is not a, a lesson in a politics and psychology in, in, in just in India. It's, 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 it's global. It's, it's a global thing. Hmm. Dev, thank you so much for the film and your time talking about it. Really appreciate it. Good luck with, with the rest of the release. Thank you so much, man. Take care. See ya. This episode of The Drop was produced by Chi Wong. If you enjoyed listening to today's episode of The Drop, make sure to follow us in your favorite podcast app, leave us a review, or better yet, share it with a friend. I'm Osman Faruqi. See you next week.